So the idea with scaffolding is that students have their zone of proximal development, which is what they're about to be able to do. So they're not there yet, but it's plus one. It's one level above them. And we want to always be taking them there. And so we use scaffolds to help them reach there. And then we also use scaffolds to help them complete something when they haven't already mastered all the parts of it. So we still want them to be able to experience success in the task, but we know that they haven't drilled on every single part of it yet. And so there's gonna be pieces that they're gonna need help with. They're not just gonna be able to do it on their own. So scaffolding is a tool that we create that allows learners to be able to reach something that is a little bit out of their reach. It's a little bit beyond them still, but they can experience success. And it also allows us to focus on whatever piece of that task we really wanted to focus on and not get bogged down on every little thing that they don't know. And so this is really about foresight with the teacher, foreseeing that some or all of my students are gonna struggle with this piece, but I wanna get them past that. So I'm gonna give them this piece. I'm gonna help them with this piece. And it's making your class be more productive and more enjoyable and allowing everyone to engage more in the classroom. That's the, the outcome of good scaffolding. So we want to scaffold along the four F's. We've talked about the importance of the four F's, usage-based linguistics, how the brain learns. People need all four F's really strongly in order to acquire proficiency. The four F's are form, function, frequency, feedback. And so I'm going to show you some examples of scaffolds that I have built for each one of those. Because when I look at my course, I think about what scaffolds do I need for each of my four F's to make sure that each of my form, four F's happens. So let's start with form. Making sure that my students are able to learn the correct form, how to change the word, how to produce the word such that it means what they want it to mean. So how do they learn that form? So I'm going to show you an example of really zeroing in on form, uh, which is using infixes. Um, Dakota language is very heavy on infixes. So using infixes to change the person of a verb. So to change it from I am doing it, to you are doing it, to he is doing it, to they are doing it. I'm, this is a long video, but I'm just gonna show you a quick little, little look at how I help them learn the form changes using infixes without giving them a really long lecture about grammar so that they can achieve those forms once they get it, once they practice with it and they're comfortable with it. So here's a tool that I made as a scaffold for form. Anke emakiasi. Ka ye. Unktomi echiasi. Unktomi echiasi. I use the spider a lot in that code instruction because it's very important in the culture. So there's two of us. I'm Anke and he's Unktomi. He's a spider. Chante mawashte. Chante mawashte. So that corresponds to this emoji. I'm good. I'm doing well. This is how I change it to say you are doing well. This is how I speak about a third person. It's a zero morphing at the infix. Today I'm feeling bad. This is you are feeling bad. This is how we say he is feeling bad. A third person is feeling bad. So I'm demonstrating how the form changes. And I'm focused in on what is different about the form. I keep the function so that they're learning it in context and they already know these in the I form. But I'm focusing on how we change it to match a different person. That's how I have scaffolded some form. Here's how I have scaffolded some function. So function is 
a little more complicated than just meaning. A lot of times when we say meaning, we think about word for word translations. Look it up in a dictionary. What does this word mean? But it's actually more complicated than that. So, so function means what does this chunk of language do? What does it achieve? What is it getting across? What is understood? What happens when I use this chunk of language? And so here's an example of something that's pretty hard to get across. And I had to really think of ways to communicate it. And it takes some time usually when students look at it, it takes them a few minutes to figure out what's going on. But then it gets across really well without the need for translation. And in this case, it's extra important that I don't translate because it doesn't quite line up to English usages. So I don't want them to be thinking in English. So I just give them some chunks and I show them really clearly what the function of those chunks are. And we give them the frequency and the repetition and they learn how to do it. And they pick this up really well, even though at first it's really confusing. So this is how I give the function of um, this is happening because this is causation because why and because. Wamatuka <laughs> So by process of, of repetition here, they've picked up on I'm happy. Why? Because I have money. So the fact of having money is coming last in the construction, but it is causing the thing that happened first in the construction. And so this is where if we start translating, if we start analyzing, students get really lost. But by just giving them the structure over and over, the meaning becomes clear. And because I didn't corrupt it with a bunch of analysis or translation, they, they start to be able to mimic this. I did this. Why? Because this. So this is the cause of this. They start to get that this is the causal relationship. But the construction starts over here, moves through these phases, and ends up here. But this is the causal relationship. So the, the, I use things that are culturally familiar to them, happy because I have money, taking an umbrella because it's raining, tired because a baby is crying. And that has illustrated the function clearly enough that they now understand that this structure functions this way without going through a process of elimination. So that's a scaffold for function. Here is a scaffold for frequency. With counting numbers, one of the downsides is you have to just do it a bunch. And it's kind of boring. But if you do it a bunch of times, you get good at it, and then you know your numbers. Uh, and so we do it a couple of times together in class, but I don't want to torture them in class. So instead, I really urge them to use this video where we count the numbers and to count along, but to replay the video over and over. So this is a way that they can provide themselves frequency without me making the course really monotonous and boring. So here's what the, this tool looks like. Um, Dona 
گذاشتیم جانا هست منشید جانا هست یامی جانا هست زبتا so you see that I go through and then I just start jumping around and this is a three minute video so they can just keep doing it back again, back again. And there's space in the video for them to try to answer, for them to try to remember. They have this in front of them as well as the function is clear. So the function and the form are right in front of them and then they're able to use that to just do frequency with this video. So I urge them to just several days in a row, just play this video over and over, practice along with it. And pretty soon those numbers take and we have really good success with that, even though the numbers bear no resemblance to any of the language that they spoke previously. And some of them are pretty hard to say. They do really well with this, with this as a form of frequency. And the last F is feedback. And feedback is tricky because um, we want them to both receive feedback and give it as much as possible. But giving feedback takes a lot of language skills. And so I provide them a scaffold where they can not only understand feedback, but they can also learn to give it. They can prepare to give it. So we, we come back to the scaffold a lot until they get used to it, until they figure out how to actually use it to give feedback. So I've phrased this in a very careful way to be commensurate with the culture. So I have said, Hewashte, this is good. Gaish, Hewashtekte. Or this will be good, meaning it's not good now, but we're not going to say anything mean. We're going to say this will be good in the future. How do we say it? So uh, we have a bunch of different choices, and you have the that's good column and the that's going to get better column. So I've tried to be positive, tried to use fun colors, and to use short phrases that they can learn. And they do pick up a couple of these even in the first couple of weeks. Um, so this is okay, this is you're doing great, and this is, well, you're on your way. And this helps them to understand when they're being given feedback as well as to give one another feedback. Um, so they learn that that was well done, that was a little bit good, that's, that's good, you did that well, you can do better, I like that, or you need to learn that. Um, so they learn various methods and they practice that and we look at examples and we play out. So this helps them again understand feedback and also give feedback so that feedback becomes a natural part of their learning process. So those are some examples of how I scaffold for the four F's, form, function, frequency, and feedback.